when you're part of a close community that shares the same beliefs, culture and way of life. Where everyone is a friend. You'd think you would be safe and secure. They've said it's trauma, so it's been blocked out. I can't remember anything. It was just quite an horrific scene, really, you know, for somebody to die in those circumstances. When friendships turn to love, things can get complicated, and sometimes those very friends can become your greatest threat. In 2011, Blackheath in South East London was the unlikely setting for a gruesome crime that made national headlines. This is where the car was set alight and where the police um, saw Gag and Deep from, so that's the side that they saw the car burning. And it's this tree, that it was all totally, it was burnt, um, fully black. It's got life again in it. It's sad coming here, but it just feels that this is where he is, and he's probably looking down at us, and you know, he knows that we, we do remember him every day. 21 year old Gagandeep Singh lived five miles away from Blackheath in Bexley Heath with his mother, Tarjinder, and sister, Amandeep. Every mom said, My son is very nice, my child is very nice, but Gagandeep is. Very loving child, very, very lovely, naughty. And when he grew up, he's very, very intelligent student. He was three years older than me. He was mature, and I was very immature. We'd have our sort of brother-sister arguments, um, you know, typical fights and stuff. Um, but I, but we, had a, we loved each other, but we didn't really express it as, um, as much as I now feel that I, I should have. And he is very, very good businessman. I'm using is because I always think he is with me. I never said was. Gagandeep's parents, Tarjinder and Charanjit, were originally from Punjab in India before moving to the UK and setting up a successful employment agency. Gagandeep got involved from a young age because mum and dad would be working and there was nowhere for us to go, so we used to go to the office. He's only eight years old when he started to make veggies with me and uh, he is with me all the time after school. Um, then he started to use a computer. A family trip back to India inspired Gagandeep to embrace his faith. But when he turned 17, he actually became a baptised Sikh. You have to be natural as the way God sent us down. So he stopped cutting his hair, he would cover his head with a turban. And from then, Sikhism was basically everything to him. In 2009, another trip to India tore the family apart. Their father, Charanjit, had gone to visit an accountant friend he had been sending money to to buy property in Punjab. However, the accountant was actually buying them in his own name. And my husband go there and ask, can you give the paperwork to me? And he hired the man and shoot him. And that's when my dad was killed. And going through that was very, very hard, very difficult. The murder of Charanjit in India hit the family hard, especially Gagandeep, who stepped into his father's shoes. I have a heart attack after my husband's death. I can't do any business, nothing. And he doing everything. Gagandeep's business career blossomed. As well as running the family firm, he also launched a new television channel, Seek TV. By the age of 21, he was a millionaire. He helped everywhere where he think there is a need. Give food to people, he give jobs to people. It was a typical act of generosity by Gagandeep that brought Harvinder Shoka into his life. A 
20-year-old trainee electrician he met at his local Sikh temple. Harvinder explained that he wasn't getting a job because of his beard and he had a turban, so Gagandip actually gave him a job. They were almost like brothers. If Gagandip wasn't here, he was at their house, or he was here. Then Mundil Mahil entered the friends' lives. Mundil Mahil was a 19-year-old medical student at Brighton and Sussex Medical School. She was in the second year of her studies uh, and on course to be a doctor. A, a bright young girl with, with plenty of opportunity ahead of her. Havinda Shoker was, I think it's fair to say, obsessed with Mundil Mahil. She seems to have told him that they were destined to be friends, not lovers, but nonetheless that she liked him. And I think there are suggestions that she sort of strung him along to get him to do things for her. Then, Gagandeep also became interested in Mundil when he met her at a Sikh festival in 2009. Shortly after that, he sent her a friend request on Facebook. She saw that he was a friend of having Ashoka and accepted the request. And from then on, they seemed to get closer. When you start a new relationship with someone, you share yourself but also reveal your vulnerabilities. And sometimes those same weaknesses can be used against you. After my dad's death, Gagani relied on Mundan a lot, so for emotional support. And it, after that, it seemed like their relationship built and built. But Gagandeep's mom was worried. I straight said to Gagan, Gagan, I don't like that girl. Don't spend your time. Don't waste your time with this girl. She's going to the temple and pub and club, and uh, she's not baptized. Don't be too serious. And uh, he said, she's just my friend. I don't know if it was a one-sided thing, because Gaganip never actually mentioned it at home. We knew there was more than friendship, but that's all we really know. I think it's fair to say, having the Shoka was beginning to get a bit jealous as well about that happening. If you think about jealousy, what is jealousy? It has its strong roots in fear. Fear of losing love, fear of losing attention, of being central to someone. There are often three people involved. There's the jealous person, there is the subject of the attention, and there is a rival. And the jealous person often feels huge levels of animosity towards their rival. As Gagandeep and Mundil got closer, it seemed he wanted more from the relationship. Things seemed to be progressing with Gagandeep Singh and Mundil Mahil until August 2010, when he uh, came on strong to her, if, if you want to put it that way. I think he wanted to go further than she did. She fought him off, she says. I don't think that was disputed. He was deeply apologetic afterwards, but I think that marked a turning point in their relationship and a cooling. Gagandeep and Mahil's relationship was frowned upon because within the Sikh community, it's somewhat taboo and culturally inappropriate for individuals to be involved romantically in a relationship outside of marriage. The allegation of sexual assault would have affected Mahil and Gagandeep negatively. Mundil Mahil didn't report the incident to the police. But despite Gagandeep bombarding her with apologetic calls and texts, the pair didn't see each other for the next six months. What I don't think he appreciated was how deeply she felt about what had happened. I think feelings inside her festered. She felt that he needed to learn a lesson. And I think as well that Mundil Mahil then used having to show her sort of friendship, if you like, his almost puppyish devotion to her to work out how to get some kind of revenge. I wonder if Harvinder's romantic obsession for Mandil might have also had built into it the desire to protect her. And all these emotionally intense things going on within him may have driven him on and motivated him to prove to her his worth. This all sort of gathered momentum, if you like, until events unfolded on a day in February the following year, 2011, when she invited Gagandeep Singh to come down to Brighton. It's a fine line between love and hate, and when you throw in jealousy, 
it's easy for things to get very, very complicated. On the 25th of February 2011, Gagandeep told his family he was going to a party and asked to borrow his sister's blue Mercedes as his car had broken down. I gave the keys to him and it was around seven o'clock in the evening that he went. I asked Gagandeep, Gagandeep, what time do you come back? And he said, a little bit late, mom. It was on the morning of the 26th of February, in the early hours, that uh, a police car was patrolling around the Blackheath area, saw a Mercedes on fire in Angustine Lane. They alerted the London Fire Brigade, who turned up and put the fire out. The vehicle was searched. The boot of the car was opened, and that was the point they found the body in the vehicle. At 2 a.m., Detective Chief Inspector Damien Elaine and his team were called out to investigate the fire. The vehicle had been severely burnt, but wasn't wholly burnt out. The body was found inside, laying on its side in, in the fetal position, but it was bound with some form of flex, and there were signs of, sort of a burnt covering of some description that had covered the body. Some people think that uh, you're able to dispose of a body through fire, but actually it's quite difficult to do so the body was intact, albeit that it was heavily charred. It was just quite a horrific scene, really, you know, for somebody to die in those circumstances. When someone is burnt in a car, it's a very intense and extreme form of killing. Ultimately, the offender is harboring an intense rage towards the victim forensically in these kind of cases is difficult for authorities to establish any DNA evidence from the crime scene of not only the victim but also the offender. At that stage we didn't know the identity of the victim but what we did have was the registration number of the vehicle which came back to an address in Bexley Heath which was a few miles away from that location. If someone turned up at your door in the middle of the night, you would know something was wrong. But it's hard to imagine the horrific news that the Singh family were about to hear. At four o'clock, door knocked and police outside. And I'm scared. So we've gone down and we've opened the door and they're asking us about where Gagandeep is. I don't know. He went to the party last night. And they started asking me about details of the vehicle and what he was wearing and where he said he was going. The police gave us information in chunks. One minute they're saying that there's a car, but there's nobody in there, and that they can't find Gagandeep. And then they mentioned that there was a body in the car. And then that the car's been burnt. So in stages, they were giving us pieces of information. Now, I don't know whether it was because it would be too much for us to take in in one go. I think maybe somebody used Gagan's car. Somebody done something Gagan's car and Gagan ran away. Although they couldn't say so, the police were concerned that the body in the car was Gagandeep. They took hairs from his comb and his toothbrush. And the reason we were doing that was to try and obtain DNA that we could compare to try and identify who the victim was. While they waited for forensic results to come back, Damien Elaine's team scoured the crime scene for evidence. Was this the murder site or was it a deposition site? And typically you'll find that there can be a link, a geographic link to where a body's been deposited, you know, how far away the offenders live. And that's how you can start knocking on doors to see if anyone saw or heard anything. But equally, looking at where cameras are. So London has probably got the most CCTV of any capital in the world. There were no eyewitnesses, but at one end of the lane, a camera did catch something. It identified two individuals that appeared to be running from the scene 
at about the time the fire was set and it certainly appeared to us that one of those individuals was wearing a turban. It's not good enough to depict any facial images, but certainly key in terms of well, you know, what happened and who might be involved. While the investigation continued, Amandeep had desperately been trying to track down her missing brother. I started contacting friends. People started posting on Facebook to try and find out where he is. So I sort of spread the word and then came back and sat with the police. We ran the vehicle registration number through the automatic number plate recognition system. And we were able to determine that the vehicle had traveled the night before around the M25 and down the M23 in the direction of Brighton in the Clackett Lane services on the M25. And we were able to obtain footage of the individual driving that vehicle that night, uh, a male going into the shop and buying a cuddly toy, soft toy, and some other items. And uh, we were later to determine that that was Gagandip Singh. One of Gagandip's friends then gave Amandeep some vital information. Gagandip went to see Mandil, and the friend had warned Gagandip, don't go. You know, you've not spoken to her in a, in a while, don't go. And all of this was news. It was new to me because I didn't know anything that was happening. So I then called Mandil. And I asked her, where's Gagandip? Has he, has he been there? And she said no. And I said, well, I've found out he has. And she said, oh, yes, yes, he came, but he left from downstairs. He didn't come inside. So in that same sort of minute of talking to her, she changed um, twice. So first she said he didn't come, and then she said, oh, yes, he did come. And that's what I told the police. Up until this point, the police had no idea what Gagandeep's car was doing in Brighton. It would prove to be critical to the investigation. We were starting to piece the jigsaw together. It was likely that... Uh, Gagandip was our victim, although to some extent the family was still holding out hope that it perhaps wasn't him. And even one of the males we'd seen on CCTV was in fact Gagandip leaving that scene. So I called Harinda Shoker and I asked him, do you know where Gagandip is because he's not been home? And he's giggled on the phone and said no. I haven't said anything funny, so why is he giggling? And that sort of I got a bit suspicious, as in he must know something, and I told that to the police as well. The badly burnt body was still unidentified, but the pathologist's report made for chilling reading. The victim had suffered blunt trauma injuries, significant injuries to the head and to the body, but one of the most important things that came out of that post-mortem was the fact that actually he'd... Um, died as a result of smoke inhalations. Soot deposits were found in his lungs uh, and in, in his larynx as, as he breathed in those, those toxic fumes. So when the fire was set in Blackheath, he was still alive. The burning car and body had been discovered around 2 a.m. By 9 p.m. the same day, the DNA results were revealed. we'd identified formally that the victim was Gurgandip Singh. And obviously that was a difficult point for us in terms of then having to tell the family, you know, that, that it was their loved one. It's a mum and dad's biggest fear that something terrible could happen to their children. But when a child dies before a parent, it upsets what is considered to be life's natural order. Before the police actually confirmed it, they had taken mum to the hospital because she's got a weak heart. And the police came to me and confirmed that it is him and you need to go and tell your mum. So they had sort of a team of doctors around her um, in case something happened. And I, it was like, I knew since, the, since sort of mid afternoon, I, I kind of knew that that's what the end result was going to be, but it was just wishing it doesn't happen. They took me to hospital because I am breathless and uh... There they said, uh, in blue Mercedes boat, he's gone. After that, I don't know. I don't know what happened. <sighs> 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 
she was tottering and saying things that didn't make sense. And I thought, oh God, I don't know what's happening to her now. And I said, I want to die. I want to die because I can't handle this. Because when he go from home, he's laughing, cuddling me. Mom, I come back very soon. And then I ask Ben a little bit late, but he never come back. Police had confirmed that the body found in the car in Blackheath was Gagandeep Singh. And I hadn't cried because I didn't know how to react. And that's when everyone sort of sat me down and they're like, you need to cry, you need to let it out. But yeah, it was just, I think I was so shocked that there was no emotions. It was, it was too much to handle. Gagandeep had last been seen alive outside Mundil Marhill's flat in Brighton. The team had a warrant to search her address. Mundil Marhill was nowhere to be seen. So we're here just outside of the centre of Brighton. It's a typical student digs area, Victorian townhouses divided into separate bedsits. And this is where Mundhill lived with her fellow students. So in Mundhill's room, which was at the rear of the property in, in the basement area, we, we found that, that, that there'd been some sort of a struggle in there. There was a camera tripod in there, which we believe may have been used in the attack in terms of blunt trauma. There was a brand new duvet cover and a receipt for the new duvet cover that was purchased after Gagandip had visited on the Friday night. Gagandip's car was filmed arriving at 11 p.m. the previous night. 20 minutes later, a neighbour reported seeing something suspicious. They'd looked out of the window and they'd seen two males carrying out a bulky object that was wrapped up in something and it was deposited into the boot of a car. The car was a Mercedes and the neighbour had taken a, a note of the vehicle registration number, which, lo and behold, was the same registration number of the Mercedes found at Blackheath. At Brighton Railway Station, the police inspected security camera footage captured earlier that night. It showed Mundil greeting two men arriving off the train from London. We knew, having interviewed the, the witnesses at the address, that one of those individuals was Shoga and somebody else by the name of Darren. And we began to look at that name, look at people connected to Shoka and we were quickly able to find out that, you know, that, that individual was Darren Peters. Both Harvinder Shoka and Darren Peters lived in the Blackheath area near the site the car was set alight. Within 24 hours of finding Gagandeep's body, the police moved in. We had sufficient grounds to arrest Shoka and we conducted that arrest and he was taken to Lewisham Police Station and we began you know, interviewing him. He was quite surprised on the face of it. Darren Peters, we arrested him subsequently. We raided his address and we found some petrol cans and we were also later to establish that he'd uh, used the victim's bank card to withdraw some money. The evidence police were gathering revealed that this attack had been carefully planned, but it's very difficult to imagine what motive there could have been for murder. It became very apparent that the key to the whole of this case revolved around Mundil Marhill. She'd orchestrated this meeting, so we were urgently seeking her whereabouts. We'd circulated her at that point as a wanted person. A case like this tends to come to the attention of somebody like me when the police are appealing for information, and I think it's fair to say that this was um, a, a notable case. Uh, in fact, you know, shocking, many people would say. Somebody who seemed fairly sort of middle class and respectable, studying to be a doctor, accused of being involved in a murder. Ports and airports had been alerted as police searched for 19-year-old Mundil Marhill. After questioning Mundil's housemates, 
police discovered her grudge against Gagandeep. It was almost described to us as an attempted rape. Whether it had gone that far or not, I don't know. There was certainly no formal allegation that was made. The news broke that this burning car had been found with a body in the boot and that two men had been arrested and their ages were given. The next day, Mundil Mahil contacted the police. I've seen this footage on the television. Yeah, I think somebody I know may have come to some harm. Would you like to speak to me? Whether she thought that she was going to be arrested or not, or not I don't know. But certainly, she, you know, when she arrived, she was arrested as, as a suspect for murder. While police were making progress with their investigation, Gagandeep's mother and sister had asked to see his body. We were told that you shouldn't go because it's not, it's not um, something you want to sort of remember. But we felt we had to go. Then they pulled the card. I see go pass. After that, I don't know. I think there was a sense of relief that it's not a skeleton um, and that we can see him and that we can still see that it's him and it's not somebody else. I'm shaking and fell on the floor, faint. I never imagined somebody's son is like this. It was becoming obvious that Mundil had set a trap for Gagandeep. But what happened next and what she knew about it was far from clear. What was really important about the account she gave in interview was that her position was that Gurgendip had left of his own free will from Gladstone Place that night, got back into his car and driven himself out of Brighton back towards London. Now, we knew that clearly wasn't the case. We knew she was lying. As police interviewed Marhill, Shoker and Peters, a clearer picture emerged of the terrible events that led up to Gagandeep's gruesome death. We examined all the suspect's phones and the victim's phone in some detail, so we were able to put together you know, chronology in terms of calls and text messages and contact on that evening. Mundil Marhill invited Gagandip Singh to come down to Brighton, where she wanted him to learn a lesson. I think there are arguments to this day about what exactly she meant by that. She asked Harvinder Shoka to come, and Darren Peters joined them, somebody that Harvinder Shoka knew. The dynamics of, the, of them as a group were quite distinct and different. So you had Mundil, who was the sort of demure professional medical student, you had Shoka, who was the apprentice electrician, and you had Darren Peters, who was probably of the three, certainly the most unintelligent of the three of them, and seen very much as the person under Shoka's control and perhaps the hired muscle. As Gagandeep was heading to Brighton that Friday night, it seems he became suspicious about why he was there. He contacted um, Mundil, so you're not gonna kill me, or words to that effect. I think uh, Gagandip, was, there was nervous anticipation, and I think he thought, you know, I think things might be back on, I can start to rebuild a relationship with her. On his way down to Brighton, stopped off at the service station, contacted Mundil to say, look, I'm still en route. She, in turn, is then forwarding his progress, or the information about his progress, onto Shoka, who's travelling down with Peters by train arrives at the railway station to pick up Shoka and Peters, you know, seemingly laughing and joking with them. She asked her friends to stay out of the basement that evening. Uh, having to Shoka and Darren Peters um, put sheets down, they donned black gloves and put clothes on over their, the ones that they were wearing, which it might lead you to think there was a degree of premeditation about what was to come. They sit around, they're socialising, eating key lime pie, waiting for the arrival of Gagandip, who's none the wiser about what was to unfold. I mean, you could almost describe it as a 
a honey trap from Mundil's point of view. She has planned and set up this whole thing that's going to go down. You think this is a 19-year-old girl who has made an accusation of sexual assault, feels violated, has found someone willing to avenge that assault in her mind. Gag and Dip Singh turned up at about 11 o'clock, as expected, and about 20 minutes later, his body was carried out of that flat, that shared house. In those 20 minutes, he was beaten, punched, coshed over the head with, it looks like a camera tripod that belonged to Mundil Mahil. Crying out for help while she sat in the next room, ignoring his pleas. That resulted then in him probably heavily unconscious at this point, being carried out, bound and gagged, put into the boot of his sister's car, where then Shoka drove that car with Peters in the front passenger seat up to London. At some point, they stopped the car and used the cable from the sat-nav to tie Gag and Dip Singh's wrists together. And they brought petrol, two jerry cans of petrol, which were subsequently poured over his body while he was still alive. There were traces of petrol found in his lungs, as well as the smoke which he breathed in and the direct cause of his death. And they, they poured petrol in the back seat of the car as well and set the car alight before fleeing at about 2 a.m. in the morning. So three hours after Gang Dip Singh turned up at the house in Brighton. After the car was set alight, Shoka had in fact called Mundhill on, on an 80 minute telephone call. Uh, and we now know that during the content of that call, Shoker had said to Mundil, I'm willing to go to prison for you for 21 years. Harvinda has obliterated his love rival, quite literally obliterated him in the most brutal way. And then to then brag about it to Mundil is a bit like, you know, bringing in the kill and going, look what I did for you. Here is the proof. It's like a prize. Already reeling from the discovery that the body in the car was Gagandeep's, his family now had to face the fact that his friends could have been responsible. When they were arrested, Darren Peters, we didn't know. Um, so we didn't really know what to think about him. But with Harinda Shoka, um, the community started saying that, oh, we saw him at the temple and he had a swollen hand. And with Mundil, because she lied to me that, that first day, I didn't believe a, a thing she was going to say. And it all started making sense. They've got something to hide. But Ben Lee said the both person done this. Oh my God. I never think Mundil and Shoka did this. Gagandeep Singh's family, still in shock after his death, could not understand how he could have died at the hands of his best friend. As a family, we didn't know that their friendship had sort of broken off. I think there was a difference um, in education. Um, they, were, they were different in every way except religion. But towards the end, when Gagandeep opened up his channel, he didn't have time for Harvinder because he had his own things to do. And that's where jealousy kicked in. We didn't know until after the death that any of this has even happened. People started sending me Facebook clippings of um, Harvinder commenting on Gagandeep's profile saying, oh, um, he's a fake Sikh, he thinks he's a big man. So there was a lot of hate going on. And Gagandeep obviously knew about this, but he never shared it at home um, because it was between friends. And they not to give a good answer why they killed Gagan. Nothing. Mandir was trying to say that Gagandeep raped her. Obviously, hearing that, we felt, you know, Gagandeep's such a respected person. Whether there was a rape or there wasn't a rape, I am not. I can't comment. Um, however, Mandil did say that it wasn't a rape, that he tried to get into bed with me. In many ways, it can be described as an honor killing, given the cultural significance of the case. Usually, these types of killings are male on male. Rarely do you find that a female's involvement is 
the coordination and the facilitating of a killing of this nature. But having said that, Mahil was a self-righteous individual. She was an individual who made it clear that she wanted to harm Gagandeep. I don't know how can they kill Gagan. I don't know. I don't know how can, how can they kill. I have only his memories. If he was, if he's alive, now I am top of the world because I am Gagandeep's mom. But now, no life, nothing. All day cry. The fondest memories of Gagandeep, I must admit, that since he's passed away, I don't have any memories. Um, they've been erased, so I can't think of anything. I've, I've had counselling and they've said it's trauma, so it's been blocked out. I can't remember anything. I only remember from the day I see his body moving forward of what's happened, but not before. So I, I look at pictures and what my mum tells me, but I don't have any memory. They're coming back, but very, very slowly. The Sikh community of South East London was upset by the murder of Gagandeep Singh and that two of his temple-going friends would stand trial for it. There was a large funeral. There was a, a massive turnout, very, very good community support for the family. He was held in very high regard. We tried to give him a really nice send-off, sort of similar to what would have happened at his wedding. So we kind of made it into a very good event for him. Horses. He liked horses and he liked the music. Flags, everybody come. Nobody, that day, nobody at home. When it was his funeral, it was like, oh, Gagandeep's coming home today. Like, he's actually going to come home. And it was a sense of happiness. Just seeing that there's so many people here for him, um, you know, it made me feel very proud of him. The time had come, finally, for Gagandeep's attackers to face trial but it was far from clear who would be found guilty of his murder. The trial started in December 2011. All the defendants, Mundil, Shoka and Peters were charged with murder uh, and all had pleaded not guilty. There were various alternative charges on the indictment and in terms of Mundil, uh, her defence counsel was able to introduce an alternative charge of griev grievous bodily harm with intent as an alternative to murder for the jury to consider. The jury's job would not be easy, as the co-conspirators suddenly weren't so cosy and all turned on each other. Mundil was quite demure. I think she wanted to portray herself as, you know, this medical student from a caring profession. Uh, and her case was that she never knew that it was going to go as far as it did go. Certainly in her mind, she never thought for one moment it was going to result in murder. Harvinder Shoka blamed Darren Peters for starting the violence. He said that Peters struck Gagadip Singh first. But I honestly think that having laid out sheets, having taken the precaution of putting on gloves and, and clothing over their own, that there was a, a, a clear understanding violence was going to happen. And I think quite severe violence. I hold my heart and sit in the court and listen what happened to Gagan that day. After a two-month trial, Darren Peters was acquitted of murder, but convicted of manslaughter and was given 12 years. While Harvinder Shoka was found guilty of Gagandeep's murder and sentenced to life imprisonment to serve a minimum of 22 years. I see the Shoka is crying when judge said 22 years. When he started crying. When Shoka got his um, conviction, we were satisfied, you know, not satisfied, but there was that sense of relief that it's, go it's going to ruin his life. Um, and that's what we wanted. But Darren Peters got 12 years, but he only served six, which is not fair. Somebody's lost their life and he's out in six years. As for Mundil Marhill, she was acquitted of murder, 
and found guilty of grievous bodily harm with intent. Her actions were calculating and that she was at the heart of a, com a criminal conspiracy with Chopra and Peters of tricking Gagandeep to Brighton to seriously assault him, which ultimately resulted in his death. In fact, under cross-examination, she was forced to admit that she had lied to police suggesting that all she had done was to lure him to what she explained to be uh, a few slaps and a lecture. Mundil Marhill was sentenced to six years in a Young Offenders Institute. She was later released on licence after serving three. When we found out the sentence that Mundil got, it was a shock. I remember coming back on the train um, and there was so much anger, I kind of felt as if Gaganip hasn't got the justice, we've lost everything. As a senior investigator, was I disappointed that Mundil Marhill wasn't convicted of murder? Yes, I think so. I think there are people who will think she got off lightly, and I don't think it's hard to understand why they would think that. I think, you know, focusing on the family, the, the, the tragedy for them to lose a father and a husband and a son and a brother in the space of two years is just incredible. And, and very, you know, you know, what are the chances of that happening to any family? To lose two loved ones, both from homicide in two wholly separate circumstances. So we're in Blackheath at the moment, Angerstone Lane, where Gagandit's car was set alight. This is where he was the last time. So there's a connection, and it's a feeling that this is where he was last alive and breathing. His face is always in front of my eyes. Always laughing face. He always cuddle me. If I said anything to him, he never say no. Always okay, mom. Because whenever I'm upset or sad, I feel that he's here. Um, so it's just a sense of him being around. Well, he knows that we're always thinking of him and that I hope he's proud of everything that I'm doing. <laughs>